If you don't have them, grab your Bibles. We're going to be continuing in our study in Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. We don't know exactly how far into ministry Jeremiah is at this time. But we can see that not much has changed. He's still bringing a message to the rebellious, idol-worshipping people of Judah, a message to repent. And what's even more amazing is, is that God is still, at this point in time, willing to endure the rejection and, well, the disregard of His people. He continues to lovingly call them back to His side. In chapter 17 and verse 1, it says that the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. With a point of a diamond, it is engraved on a tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars, while their children remember their altars and their wooden images by the green trees of the hills. The Lord says that the sin of the people is etched or engraved deeply into their hearts, and it's in their worship as well. Now, this idea of a pen of iron is that the sin is not on the top of the page, as would be ink with paper, but that it's chiseled deep into the heart of His people. And the Lord provides us with four different images here that I think are worth taking a moment and looking at. The first one is the fact that the sin is written. And as I looked at this and as I studied, thinking about that which is written and is etched deep within a culture, it's sad but it's true that Sin often tries to hide in the law of man. There's an idea that if man approves of some sort of sin, then if they can somehow validate it by virtue of making it legal, that in some way God has to go along with it. It goes on to say that it's engraved on their hearts. And the problem with written sin is that it moves throughout a culture to include the church. And we see this in our country in such areas as legalized abortion and gay marriage and recreational drug use and all kinds of others and the things that are written into the law that even so many that proclaim to be Christians are not only tolerant of and they abide by, but they will even go to the place of supporting. We saw this locally and I have to tell you, it was probably my greatest sense of heartbreak when we were looked at the, the, the possibility of a brothel initiative that would take and would once and for all overturn legalized prostitution in our, in our county. What was most heartbreaking, though, were the number of folks that I saw within the Christian community that stood in favor of support of prostitution. Support based on the fact that it was legal, and therefore somehow or another the fact that something that would be an abomination before God, something that is wrong based on what God's Word says, is all of a sudden something that should be supported and continue simply because it has been deemed legal. Just because something's legal doesn't make it right, and nor will it ever make it right in the eyes of our Lord. It says also that it is deep in their worship. And guys, we know that there's much sin over the years that has moved into the church. We used to talk about how we were afraid of the cultural creep, the culture creeping into the church. And yet, we've seen some churches that rather than standing at the door using the Word of God as the gatekeeper, have literally busted open the doors and invited in any aspect that the culture would deem, well, acceptable and appropriate, and not so would it be seen by God. The result of this is going to be devastation to our children, and this is exactly what the Lord is saying. As He says, the kids sit by and they watch and they see these things happening. And folks, the problem with a generation that turns away from the Lord is that it isn't just that generation that suffers. The rebellion is learned and it becomes ingrained within the children. And whereas our grandfathers and our fathers may have rebelled and may have backslidden away from God, they knew and they were aware that the actions that they were committing were sin, even if they chose not to correct or repent of that sin. You see, sin has always been a choice. But for the child who grows up in a rebellious house where God is not acknowledged, then their future becomes most hopeless unless by the grace of God that they come to salvation away from that which they have been taught. 
You see, the role of a parent, though, is supposed to be to teach and to instruct our children in the ways of the Lord with the hope that as they would grow older that they would not depart from the things of the Lord. But remember, a child is always going to adhere to that from which they've learned. In verse 3 it says, Oh, my mountain in the field, I will give as plunder your wealth. All your treasures and your high places of sin within all your borders. And you, even yourself, shall go or shall let go of your heritage which I gave you. And I will cause you to serve your enemies in a land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. God has such blessing and prosperity in mind for his people. And the same is true today. God wants to, as a good father, as a gracious and loving father, wants to give to us the best, the blessings, the things that would be good for us. And we're going to see his heart given to us a little later in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11 where he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Oh, that's one of my family's favorite verses. You see, the Lord desires to do good, but He'll not turn from His justice in the face of sin. Now the world, the world wants a God that not only will allow sin, but accept it and even bless through the process of sin. They want a God that won't judge, a God that will go along with their will, our will, rather than His will. <clears throat> but understand, God will never accept sin He'll never compromise justice. And this warning says that sin kindles a fire which will burn forever. So thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. For his heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited now i don't know if you've ever been by the church here after one of our well after the wind blows a little bit in dayton and you know it has a tendency to do that just a little the other day the wind stopped blowing for a while and i thought maybe i was somewhere else i had left the area but one of the things that happens after one of these windstorms is that we have this tumbleweed relocation program that takes place and all of the tumbleweeds between here and smith's wind up being pushed up against our fence in front of the church. Now, if they breach the fence, if they go over the top of the front fence, then we normally will find them and collect them throughout the rest of the property caught in the back fence in the back. One of the things that I've noticed about tumbleweeds is that they're dry and they're really not good for anything. They really have no value. I mean, as a matter of fact, the only thing that they do is they create this process of work for the ones that have to try to clear them out of the way. And if you've ever grabbed a tumbleweed without a glove on, you know that it's not something that's a good thing. If anything, well, it kind of points out the Lord's condition of being a dry shrub. Oh, but it goes on in verse 7, and it says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Now, I don't, I, I don't understand. I don't understand how anyone can look at this and not see the clear benefit of returning or coming to the Lord. And remember, these are God's people. This isn't, this isn't the world in general. This isn't a God-rejecting world that refuses to acknowledge. This is God's people. And what God is saying is that you're settling for tumbleweeds instead of blessings. He says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. And I think that it's interesting and it's no accident that we see trust precedes hope. Trust, according to my friend Webster, says that it's a confidence. It's a reliance or the resting of the mind on the integrity, veracity, justice, friendship, or other sound principle of another person. I like that. We can place our trust, listen, in the integrity, the veracity, the justice, the friendship, and the sound principles of God. We have this opportunity to be able to 
have this great benefit. I don't have to rely on my strength, on my wisdom, on my integrity. I can do so by placing my trust in God. And when I do, it allows me then to have hope. To have hope. As I would trust the Lord, then hope becomes real. Hope becomes something that is tangible. Webster defines hope as this. It's a desire of some good, accompanied with at least a slight expectation of obtaining it, or a belief that it is obtainable. Hope differs from a wish, in that it applies some expectation of obtaining the good desired, or the possibility of possessing it. Hope, therefore, listen, always gives pleasure or joy. It says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Why? It goes on in verse 8, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from yielding fruit. The advantage is without comparison here. Those who trust and hope in the Lord are able to stand in the times of hardship. Guys, we're in the midst of a time of hardship, and I don't know how anyone out there without a relationship and, and, and an understanding of not only the things of God, but a personal relationship with God, the ability to trust and have hope in the Lord, is enduring right now. I don't know how it's even possible. We are in a time of drought. We're in a time of dryness. We're in a time where fear and anxiety are running rampant. And yet, it tells us that the one who places his trust and his hope in the Lord, blessed. This word blessed means happy. Yeah, I look around right now, and it's kind of hard to find happy people. I mean, people are really on edge right now. I mean, it's, it's starting to get to the point to where people are starting to, well, they're starting to kind of be tired of what's going on and want to get back to some sense of normality or something. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of the aspect of happiness of life right now that is kind of on hold. And yet we're told, happy, blessed is the man, is the woman who trusts and hopes in the Lord. Guys, I don't want to try to stand without the Lord through this time, and nor should we. Oh, then it goes on. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now, there's some real encouragement for you, huh? I mean, isn't that a great way to, I mean, isn't that a great way to, like, introduce a topic to somebody? Hey, by the way, you know what? Your heart is deceitful above all things and is wicked. This is so contrary to what we want to believe. But understand, the heart of man is deceitful. And this word deceitful, this idea of it being deceitful, is, a, is a, translated as it lies. It lies. The greatest source of false information in our lives is the epitome, the greatest source of what we could call fake news comes from our own heart. Every time, every time I hear somebody say, oh, just follow your heart, I want to jump up and scream, no, don't follow that wicked thing. It's deceiving. It's lying to you. It's not telling you the truth. And if you know this to be true, because if you've walked with the Lord for any period of time, you recognize and you realize that even as a believer, even as one who is walking and desiring the things of the Lord and empowered by the Holy Spirit, as we look back, I've never found a born-again believer that says, you know what, this isn't true. I've never had one of them come back after, after the period of walking with the Lord for any period of time and go, you know what, I, I don't think that my heart was wicked. I said, like, oh, my heart is still wicked. It still lies to me. And yet, it doesn't have to in Christ Jesus. I... I once heard about a young pe preacher that was doing a tent revival in a small community, and he was having a really hard time drawing people into the messages. And he was, he was young, and because he was young and he wasn't well-known, he didn't have a great following, so people weren't coming. So night after night, as they would populate the tent, he would look out, and there would be just a handful of people. And so he talked to one of his mentors, and the guy said, well, here's what you do. And he gave him this strategy for packing the house. And he said, put it out into the community that in this 
next service, you are going to reveal the biggest liar in town. You're going you're to take and you're going to dis- d- divulge who it is in, in this community that is the most untrustworthy, biggest liar that's out there. And that night, the house was packed. The house was completely packed because there were people that showed up. They wanted to see who it was that was going to be the liar and who was going to be identified, or they wanted to make sure it wasn't them. It didn't matter. And the young preacher opened up the word to this place in Scripture, and he identified to everybody sitting in the room that the greatest liar that was there was in the heart of each and every person that was there. And it is so true. It is so true. It goes on. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, and I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. From the very first time that we as children start becoming aware of the world around us, we start becoming aware that there's interactions with others around us, we start perfecting the art of concealing our heart and our thoughts. I mean, we do. We have to start coming to this place to where we have this ability to be able to not demonstrate what we're thinking and what we're feeling. And i got to tell you what, I, I just cringe at the idea of my thought life being on display. I mean, can you imagine what it would look like if we had a billboard across the top of our head that when a thought popped in that it just scanned across there and it read? We wouldn't be able to go outside. You talk about quarantine. You talk about never being able to go out. And we would be wearing masks not down here on our faces. We'd be wearing them on our forehead so people couldn't see what we were thinking. Who can know what somebody is really thinking? And here's where we often make some of our greatest errors in judgment because <laughs> this is where we can so easily tumble into sin. Because I can't know what somebody is thinking completely, because I can't really decipher exactly what it is, I am often willing to provide interpretation based on the way I see it. I'm willing to put and interpret what someone else is thinking based on what I think they think. And in so doing, over the years, I've gotten really good at assigning intent to others based on my point of view. But the only one that is capable of knowing the heart and the mind of man is God. And He's the only one that's capable of judging rightly when it comes to intention. It says in verse 11 that as a partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets riches but not by right. It will leave him in the midst of his days and at the end, at his end, He will be a fool. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed, but those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. The highest place of deception is within ourselves. And if we buy the lie that our heart is selling, then our future is going to be one of devastation and destruction. We're going to fail. And the enemy is always so quick to come alongside our hearts, our thoughts, our desires, and try to push those ahead of the heart and the desire that God would have for us. And so the Lord says that if you try to do it your way, it will be, in the end, as if you are a fool. Again, I don't know how long Jeremiah has been at this, but we can see that it starts to take a toll on him now as he cries out to the Lord and he says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Indeed, they say to me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. So Jeremiah has been bringing this warning for quite some time. And what's happening is is that the people are not only not listening, they take it a step farther. And they challenge him. If God is going to do something, if if this word that you're preaching, if this warning that's coming forth, all of these things that you're saying, if God is going to do something, tell him to get busy. They're even willing to challenge God by 
saying that somehow or another that if he's going to do it, then he needs to do it now. And it's interesting because over the years, I've run into people that have this attitude. I've run into people that are willing to challenge God that by somehow they think that if they escape instant judgment, that it proves that God is either unable to reach them or that God is not at all. If there is a God, if He is going to judge me, let Him do it now. Come on, God, give me your best shot. I can't tell you how many times I've thought, oh, Lord, please, (laughs) do it. Just do it. I mean, somebody's challenging. Somebody's like waving their fist at God, and I'm like, okay, God, you don't have to like smoke him completely, but can you just set his head on fire? Can you just like burst his scalp into flames? And that way other people will see God. Oh, think about this. Other people will see you pouring out wrath on him, and they'll come to salvation. Come on, God, you can do this. The answer that more often, though, I get from the Lord is found in His grace and His mercy and His desire that none would perish. And as I would come to the Lord and ask Him to bring judgment on others, very often I'm reminded of the judgment that He bore for me. The Lord demonstrated His grace and His mercy in the person of Jesus Christ, the one that came to seek and save the lost, but understand If you don't find him as Savior, you'll meet him as your judge. As for me, he says in verse 16, I have not hurried away from being a shepherd who follows you, nor have I desired the woeful day. You know what came out of my lips. It was right there before you. Do not be a terror to me. You are my hope in the day of doom. Let them be ashamed. Who persecute me but do not let me be put to shame let them be dismayed but do not let me be dismayed bring on them the day of doom and destroy them with double destruction you see jeremiah in the midst of doing this status check with god he wants to make sure that he and god are okay and we see him do this several times in his communication with god god we're okay right we're doing every I, i'm doing everything that i can to follow you these guys are the ones that are turning away these guys are the ones that are doing everything wrong remember i'm the one that that continually comes to you on their behalf but yet they continue to reject you how about how about god you just send a little doom and gloom a little destruction their way. I mean, imagine for a minute in a ministry where no one ever responded. I mean, it's kind of like, oh, maybe like preaching to an empty room. Knowing that there's folks that are watching is great. But can you imagine if there was never any opportunity for people to respond, how your heart would get to the point at some point in time that you say, God, do something. Shake them up. Set them on fire, Lord, and if necessary, do so by virtue of destruction in order to get some sort of response. And so what's interesting is I don't think that the response that Jeremiah got was the one that he expected. Look at what the Lord answers in verse 19. Thus the Lord said to me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people by which the kings of Judah come in and by which they go out and in all of the gates of Jerusalem, and say to them, Hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, who enter by these gates. Thus says the Lord, Take heed to yourself, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it into the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. But they did not obey nor incline their ear but made their neck stiff that they might not hear nor receive instruction and it shall be if you heed me carefully says the lord to bring no burden through these gates of this city on the sabbath day but hallow the sabbath day to do no work then shall enter the gates of this city kings and princes sitting on the throne of david riding in chariots and on horses They and their princes, accompanied by men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, in this city shall remain forever. And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places around Jerusalem and from the land of Benjamin 
and from the lowlands and from the mountains and from the south, bringing burnt offering and sacrifices, grain offerings and incense, bringing sacrifices of praise to the house of the Lord. Oh, Jeremiah is frustrated. Jeremiah is frustrated at the lack of progress and he wants the Lord to turn on the folks, but instead, the Lord has another plan. And I find it really interesting because the Lord tells Jeremiah to go to the leaders of the people. He says, go to each one of the gates of the city. Go to where the people come in and out. Go to where there's traffic. And wherever there's traffic, what you need to do is you need to tell them, thus says the Lord, you need to hallow. You need to go back to honoring the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath, we know, was given to Israel. It was a day of rest. It was a day of rest and a time of communion with God. And it started on sundown on Fridays, and it ended sundown on Saturday. And, 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 and the Lord specifically set this side away, or time away, for Israel to have fellowship and worship and communion and rest. It's as if the Lord says, okay, Jeremiah, they're not listening to the larger plan. <laughs> They're not going to repent of all of their sin. They're not going to tear down their idols. They're not going to stop doing everything that, that you've been warning. Okay, let's, let's start small. Let's go to something very, very basic. Tell the people, modern day translation, go to church. Go to church. Start somewhere. Just do something that moves you from the place where you are back in the direction of God. And this happens all the time. This happens all the time when I'm out and about. I'll run into somebody that I haven't seen for a while. I haven't seen at church for a while. And the first thing that they'll say when they see me is, hey, how are you? And I'm always doing great. And then I ask them how they're doing. And most of the time, it's, well, at best, they're okay. More often than not, they're not okay. Things are not going well. As a matter of fact, after they'll explain the woes and the things that are going on in their life, I always wait for that time for them to stop, settle, and look at me and go, you know, I really ought to go back to church. And everything that's within me, and understand, this is, go, this is why I can't have the thing on my forehead. Because even though I smile and I just nod and I encourage them, there would be this big sign on my forehead that would say, well, duh, you think? You think the problem is, is that you've separated yourself from the thing? Do you really? Have? And guys, I would never say that out loud. But boy, I sure think it. I sure come to the place of thinking, you've got to be kidding. You're just now coming to this revelation that all these things are falling across, apart in your life and simply because you happen to come across the pastor in the aisle at Home Depot, all of a sudden you have this great revelation that you need to go back to church. And of course I'm going to encourage that. And I believe that this is what God had with Jeremiah. Get him to start small. Get him to do one thing. Get him to go back and honor the idea of rest and the idea of time off and the time of worship. But if you'll not heed me and hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour, devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Guys, I love the fact that God is always a God of second and third and fourth and fifth and however many chances that we need, the Lord is willing to continue to give us a way out of destruction. He is always willing. As long as there is breath, there is hope, there is, there's this opportunity for us to turn and to come back to the Lord. But understand that the Lord is not going to relent. He is not going to come off of His judgment for those who do not. There has to be a response. There has to be a willingness to return in order for us to forego this aspect of judgment that is coming. As we move into the next chapter, as we move into chapter 18, I get the sense that God is going to put some new toolbox or tools in Jeremiah's toolbox. And I can relate to the feeling that, that maybe there needs to be a new approach. There needs to be a new way of reaching folks. And guys, I have absolute, complete confidence in the Word of God and in the salvation that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other way by which men are saved than by placing their faith in Jesus. I have no doubt in that whatsoever. But there are times when I think, based on where we are and where the culture is, what can we do in order to be able to 
reach more people? How can we package that message in such a way that while we would change the methodology, understand we will never change the message. The message remains the same. That through Jesus and through Christ and through Christ alone, salvation comes. God's going to take Jeremiah on a field trip. And he's going to take him and give him an object lesson that he in turn can share with the folks to give him a picture of how God sees what's happening. This is the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. I love this picture of God directing Jeremiah to go in order that he might grow. The Lord says, go to a new place, and there I will cause you, almost force you, compel you, set a scenario, set a circumstance by which you will hear my word. You'll hear something that is potentially different than what you've heard. It'll be a revelation. And folks, there's times when we have to respond to the Lord in the direction in which he's leading us in order for us to receive a new revelation for our life. The answer to the circumstance or to the situation or the direction comes only when we are willing to go to the place that God would have us to go. There's times where we have to go in order to grow. You see, so often when we're struggling and we need a fresh message from the Lord, Instead of going, we wait. And I have people all the time say, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord for Him to to tell me what it is that I'm supposed to do. Understand, that's a very scriptural, biblical, and right thing. We are supposed to wait on the Lord. We are supposed to be those that are willing to wait on the Lord rather than rush in our own will and our own strength to find solution. We're supposed to allow the Lord to bring that on. But you've heard me say this before, and I will say it again. Waiting is not equal to doing nothing. Waiting isn't a matter of of sitting and waiting to the degree that we do absolutely nothing. And I've I've told you this before, and I kind of get this picture in my mind, and it's not necessarily exactly how it is set in Scripture, but this works the way I decipher it. I look at it as being, I'm supposed to wait on the Lord. I am the Lord's what? Servant. Oh, think about a waiter. (laughs) Think about somebody that's waiting on you in the process of being your servant. And as we would wait on the Lord, as we would allow Him to be able to reveal things to us, we never give up what we know for what we don't. We continue with that which God has already showed us. We continue to move forward. And there are times when the reason that God is not revealing something to us is because we haven't responded to His instruction to go, to do something, to fix something, to remove something, to repent of something. In our lives, it's keeping us from the place of receiving the revelation that we need from God. So Jeremiah goes. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Now, very familiar place in Scripture, and the symbology that we see here is so important that we get, it, we get it right. We understand that this imagery that we have here is that God is the potter. God is the one that's the creator. He's the one that's fashioning and shaping. The wheel? Well, it's our circumstances in life. It's the thing that we get on and we go round and round and round and round. It's the, the things that, that cause us to be in motion, which means... We're the lump. We're the clay. We're the part that is put on the wheel in order to be completely controlled by the Lord or by the potter. You see, he's able to make and remake the clay into anything he desires, anything that seems good to him. And we need to understand that as those that are in this relationship with him that we have yielded to him everything that we are that allows him to shape us any way he chooses it says then the word of the lord came to me saying "O house of israel can i not do with you as this potter says the lord look as the clay is in the potter's hand so are you in my hand O house of israel 
This is such an amazing and such an important part. You are in my hand. I can do anything I want with you. You know, the problem with this is that sometimes clay gets stubborn. Sometimes we think somehow or another that we shouldn't allow the Lord to shape us and to mold us and to put us into the place that He wants us to. And so we will become this thing that would even resist and rebel against the touch of the master, the potter. But the thing that we have to realize is that God is in control. Listen, God is in control rather the clay recognizes it or not. So many people think that they're the potter. They think they're the master of their own destiny. And the reality is, is that they're nothing but a lump of clay. And they're going to be pushed and they're going to be molded and they're going to be shaped and they're going to be fashioned into either what God wants them to be or what the world wants them to be. Last year we had a chance to travel with the kids and we were in the Great Smoky Mountains. And it was a wonderful town, beautiful, beautiful location, beautiful area. And in one of the little towns that we were in, we found a, a pottery house. And we signed up for a day class to go throw clay. I, I learned that te technical term. You throw it. You don't do it. It's what you do. When you put it on a wheel, you throw clay. I didn't know that was what it was called. But the goal was is that we were going to go in and we had a master craftsman, a master potter, who was going to teach us how to throw clay, how to shape clay, how to do this. And the goal was something that would hold coffee, a cup. That was our end game, was to come up with something. So the first thing he did is he gave us practice lumps. He gave us some clay that wasn't going to be the final process, but he figured we needed some practice. And you know what? We found out very, very quickly that it looks easy, but it's not. It's real easy to overwork the clay. It's real easy to get it to a point that it literally just wants to fling off the wheel. It's real easy to, to, to under overwork and make it too wet or make it too dry and to have all kinds of... But before you know it, you're sitting there with what was this lump of clay just spread out all over the place. And you think, man, this really takes some skill. If somebody's going to take and do this, they have to have a certain level of skill. But what I learned out of this experience more than anything else was that the potter is always in control. The clay shouldn't in any way and really can't in any way interfere with the process. And if the clay becomes difficult to work with, well, it's very likely that the potter will discard it. The guy that was teaching the class, this master potter, talked about the difference in types of different clay. And he talked about the age of the clay and the wetness of the clay and where it came from and which clays were good for certain kinds of, of, of things. And he said and there, were, there were certain types of clay that had imperfections in it and they would either get to the place of discarding it or not using it for a delicate piece. It might be good for, for something other than, well, a fine piece of pottery, but... For the most part, the master was going to have, in all times, his way. And guys, when we remember that we're the clay, whether we recognize it or not, if the Lord chooses, he can make with us something that is so beautiful. He can make an urn that can be filled with His blessings, that can be filled with His glory, that can be filled to the place of overflowing and being poured out upon the world. He has the ability to be able to transform this lump of clay into something useful for His glory, for His honor, for the kingdom of God. But if the clay becomes rebellious, if the clay chooses to be difficult... I fear that rather than being a very fine and well-designed urn, that we can put ourselves in the place of being designed more to look like a bedpan than something that is worthy of the blessings of the Lord. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up or to pull it down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil... I will relent of the disaster that I have thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. 
You see, God is always going to be fair. He's always going to be just. If he says that if you turn from your evil, then I'm going to relent, then I'm going to not bring this destruction upon you, then he means it. He says, if you don't turn from your evil, and I've promised you good, then I'm going to relent on that. I'm going to pull back and not provide the good that I'm withholding from you for the purposes of you going in your own way and doing that which is evil. But look at what the response of the people is. Look at what it says in verse 12. This is, this is amazing. And they said... Oh, I'm sorry, back up to verse 11. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord... Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now everyone from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. Again, the warning could not be any clearer. The warning to the people where the Lord comes in and he says, I want you to turn. You're headed for disaster. I am actually fashioning. I'm, I'm, I'm putting into play and into this process of a disaster that is coming your way. You need to turn, and you need to turn quickly. And now look at what their response is. And they said, that is hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans, and we will, everyone, obey the dictates of his evil heart. This is amazing. We're too evil to change, is the response. I mean, if you ever talk to somebody that says, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to change. I'm too set in my ways. I can't, I can't change that. I, I have people all the time that will talk about, man, if I, ever fell, if I ever came into church, the roof would cave in. I said, I'd like to see that. Come on in. Let's see if the roof actually will cave in. And then I've had people that have actually come to church after making that statement, and I'll look at them and I'll go, okay, guess what? It made it through one more Sunday. Because if I can come in and I can stand in this house, then anybody can come in and stand in this house because we're all sinners. Not one of us is good. And yet by the grace of God, as we would seek Him, we don't have to worry about overcoming the things in our past. No one has sinned to a place and to a point that God, full of grace and mercy, is not willing to forgive if there is true repentance and a true acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There's only, as we've talked about and we've discussed we just saw recently in lesson that there's only one unforgivable sin, and that's to refuse the testimony, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and not believe that Jesus Christ is saved. That's the only thing that can keep you out of heaven. The only thing that can keep you out, the only sin that will cause you not to have any shot at heaven is to refuse Jesus Christ. Therefore, Thus says the Lord, Ask now among the Gentiles, Who's heard such things? The virgin of Israel has done a very horrible thing. Will a man leave the snow water of Lebanon, which comes from the rock of the field? Will the cold flowing water be forsaken for strange waters? Modern day translation, the Lord in His response to them saying they're too evil is that is the stupidest thing that I've ever heard. That is the most ridiculous, not even the Gentiles, not even the heathens, not even folks that are totally outside. Again, this is the house of Israel. This is God's people. Not even those that don't know me would come up with such a ridiculous excuse that they are too evil to change their ways. And why would it be that Israel, my bride, which I have provided clean, pure, flowing water, would turn to a stagnant pond but because my people have forgotten me and they have burned incense to worthless idols and they have caused themselves to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in pathways and not on a highway to make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing everyone who passes it will be astonished and shake their head i will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy and i will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. Again, we have to remember that God is speaking to Israel. He's not warning the world. He's talking to His people. And one of the things that really caught my eye in this is this aspect of saying that, and they have caused themselves to stumble in their ways. They've stumbled because they've disregarded the ancient 
paths. They've chose to walk on rugged terrain, on areas that is not blessed by God, rather than on the highway. In my lifetime, I've seen a great departure from the ancient ways. Never in any other time in our recent history have we seen the removal of barriers in our moral and cultural understanding of what's right and wrong. We should remember that barriers were put in place because they provide protection. And we've lost so much of this in our modern culture, and the threat has even increased even more right now as we go through these current crisis and we see the circumstances that has happened because there's so many that are willing to throw away process, so many willing to, to throw away procedure for expediency based on fear. And folks, before we kick down a barrier, we need to ask why that barrier was there in the first place. What did that barrier protect us from? What was the purpose? Why was it something that was put in place and has been in place for so long? And now all of a sudden we're saying, hey, we don't need that anymore. Well, be careful. All we need to do is look back over recent years and by holding our current condition up to the Word of God, we see where the removal of barriers has brought great devastation. We need to look no further than a cursory survey of our social and educational and economic condition to see that the removal of such barriers that were there to protect have now caused us to stumble greatly. What the world calls progressive social reform is in reality the removal of protective barriers that will lead us to destruction. And I'm setting myself to be unpopular amongst the progressives, I know. What I just said alone is enough to, to label me outside the mainstream and radical. But I'm in good company because they did the same thing to Jeremiah. In verse 18 it says, And they said, Come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us attack him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. And the people said, it's real simple. Let's go after him and let's slander him. Let's start calling him names. Let's start spreading all types of lies about him. And let's discredit him and make him the problem. We have our own priests. We have our own prophets who will side with us. So we don't have to listen to him. And so he cries out to the Lord. He says, give heed to me, O Lord, and listen to the voice of those who contend with me. Shall evil be repaid for good? For they have dug a pit for my life. And remember, I stood before you to speak good for them, to turn away your wrath from them. Jeremiah goes there. He says, God, what's happening here? He says, I'm the one that's coming under attack. And i got to tell you, there's been times when I've felt the same way. There's been times when I've gone to the Lord and said, Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? These guys are after my blood. These guys are talking about me. These guys are talking about the, the church and talking about my family and talking about me personally. They're saying all kinds of rotten and terrible things. He goes on, he says, they've dug a pit and they're looking to throw me in it and bury me in it. He says, Lord, I'm the one that was coming to you on their behalf. I was asking for you not to. To bring you around. And, and they don't see that. They have no idea that what I'm doing is for their good and their protection, trying to turn them from the destruction that's coming. And how often do we feel like that as believers? As those that are trying to share with folks, and what we get back from them is this aspect of them just looking to do anything they can to discredit us. Therefore, deliver up their children to famine and pour out. Their blood by the force of the sword. Let their wives become widows and bereaved of their children. Let their men be put to death. Their young men be slain by the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard from their houses when you bring a troop suddenly upon them. For they have dug a pit for me and hidden snares for my feet. Yes, Lord, you know all their counsel which is against me. To slay me, provide no atonement for their iniquity, nor blot out their sin from your sight. But let them be overthrown before you. Deal thus with them in the time of your anger. Well, Jeremiah's kind of finding himself in that place of self-pity, looking for the Lord to come and be his defense, looking for the Lord to come and, and bring the fire, if you will, and 
I know whenever I call for the Lord to judge somebody else that He reminds me of the one that bore my judgment. Oh, we'll see next time, because this is as far as we'll go tonight, but we'll see next time how it is that the Lord responds to Jeremiah this time. But guys, here's the idea, and here's what I want you to take away for this evening. Here's what I want you to hold on to. We can either be tumbleweeds. (laughs) We can either be that tumbleweed that's blowing across the desert, that's dry, and that is absolutely of no use. Or we can find ourselves being trees that are planted by streams of living water. We can be that that in a time of fear, in a time of drought, have no sense of fear because we are so deeply rooted in the promises of God and and in the, the living water that is Jesus Christ that we do not stop even bearing fruit. As a matter of fact, that we would produce more fruit so that those that are dry, those that are parched, can come and receive salvation. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Heavenly Father God, Lord, we just thank you that we can look at your word and we can see just your heart being poured out upon this people, this people that is rejecting you, these people that are, that are doing anything that they can to remove themselves, even to the place of saying, we're too evil to be good. We're too bad to be good. And Lord, your response is, that's ridiculous. That's out of the question. If you'll turn from your evil, then there is peace, then there is comfort, then there is blessing from a God who loves you. But if you don't, then that fire will be kindled for all of eternity. And guys, so tonight, if, if you're listening to this and you haven't already given your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you there's no other means by which salvation can be received except through and by Jesus Christ. That's the place where you start. You start by coming to a place of understanding that you can't provide for yourself the salvation that you so desperately desire. And you do. The problem is is you're looking in the wrong place for it. The world can't provide it. There'll be no comfort. There'll be no peace. There will be nothing that lasts of this world into eternity. But we have a Lord. We have a God that loves us. And as He has been patient with Israel, He's been patient with you. But realize, a day will come when Jesus will no longer be available as a Savior. The only way that you will see Him is as a judge. So be the clay. (laughs) don't try to be the potter be the clay allow him to shape and to mold you and to fashion you and to create in you something beautiful something worthy to contain the blessings of God and the salvation that he offers